over to uh, Kit um, for the next section. So hello everyone, um, I am Kit Kowalski and I believe that we need to talk about ACON. So firstly, uh, who am I? Well, I'm an ordinary adult human Sheila. I'm a mum of two kids who have personalities, not gender identities. I have a professional interest in knowledge management, data and IT systems and a personal interest in politics and feminism. I write my, my gender critical blog at ladykitkowalski.wordpress.com. And uh, what do I know anyway? Well, in June last year, I was part of a group of women that submitted FOI requests to government bodies asking about their relationship with ACON. And I just happened to be the nerd who sat down and um, every night <laughs> analyzed the results. What came out of that was a website, ACON Exposed, and that's really just a repository of the FOI data with a little bit of analysis overlaid over the top. I was quite careful not to be too political or polemic um, when writing that website. I really wanted like just the facts to be available. Something that did come out of that was uh, two articles in the Daily Telegraph in August. And I was recently on the Giggle podcast with Sal Grover. And so I do recommend you check it out because we got to have a really long talk about ACON. And more generally, uh, my research acts as an enabler for women writers. So I'm often asked to sort of fact check this and that um, when somebody wants to make a point about, um, about how ACON is, is influencing Australian politics. So why ACON? Um, and this one is subtitled, um, you know, why don't I just go and get a life? Um, well, why doesn't the ABC report on the negative side of gender identity? Why doesn't the SBS? Why does everyone keep platforming Jordan Raskopoulos? Why didn't the Australian Human Rights Commission support Sal Grover when she was allegedly being harassed by Roxanne Tickle? Who wrote the trans inclusion guidelines for, for Australian sport? Why does the Department of Defence fully fund sex reassignment surgery? Why do Coles and Woolworths offer transition leave that covers going to get a new haircut and changing your documents? Why can't the Leichhardt Women's Health Service say the word breastfeeding on Facebook? Why are there men in women's prisons? Why is the New South Wales Health Department promoting intersectionality in their strategies without defining intersectionality in their strategies? Why did Medicare change the forms to say birthing parent, not mother? Why does your workplace pride club get to speak at town hall meetings and address the entire workforce, but no other special interest club does? And why are you donating to wear it purple at work again? Well, since 2010, ACON have been actively positioning themselves as an authority on sexuality, sex, gender, gender diversity, diversity, inclusion and well-being in Australian workplaces. They run a membership scheme called Pride and Diversity and they operate a benchmarking tool called the Australian Workplace Equality Index. They have links to universities, government, councils, retailers, consultancies, law firms, manufacturing, tech, media, you name it, right? They have positioned themselves in that industry. And this is what I'd like you to know today. When we say that someone can be in a con or in the scheme, it's really important to understand that there are two ways that this is usually happening. Firstly, there is pride and diversity, and that is how ACON position themselves as expert advisors within an organisation. So they're the self-proclaimed experts. They develop relationships with the HR managers and the executive leadership. Uh, the organisation pays, like, $6,000 or $10,000 
Basically, it's just a badge money scheme. So they get to put their logo on the inclusive employer website and there's not much more to it than that. So the first way is they can pay to be in the scheme and have ACON basically on hand as advisors. And the second way is the Australian Workplace Equality Index. And this is the way that ACON directs organisation organizations and rewards them for compliance with ACON's agenda. It's a benchmarking tool. Anyone can participate. They say it's free, just try it. You get a score and then, you know, if it's not very good, you can better your score next year. It's fine, just get involved. The way that they garner compliance is with points and awards. When we look at who's participating in each of these ways, um, in the Pride and Diversity, we have almost 300 total members, uh, 72 are public sector, and these are each paying 6,000 and a small few are paying 10,000 as like a higher, higher fee. And then when we look at the Australian Workplace Equality Index, in 2021, they had 123 participants and 41 were public sector. Again, this is free and they're just doing it to get the points and to get the awards. So this is still, they have quite a strong influence. I'll just also note that um, you don't have to be a member to, to do the AWEI and vice versa. So there's a little bit of overlap in these numbers, but they're not, they're not a one-to-one. -one. The two schemes do work together. If you do the AWEI, you don't have to be a member. You don't have to get ACON in to train your staff. You don't have to send your staff to, um, to ACON conferences, but it does help. If you're a Pride and Diversity member, you don't have to do the AWEI. You just pay your money. But... If you are a member, you do get AWEI points. So they're kind of reinforcing each other. Again, you don't have to send your staff to uh, the awards dinners or the conferences, but it's worth noting that every year the Australian Taxation Office receive AWEI points for donating $11,000 to the awards dinner and they receive points for paying to send their staff members to go to the awards dinner. You don't have to get ACON to provide consultancy and training services. In fact, the SBS paid Pride and Diversity consultancy dollars to develop their own LGBTIQ training that then they roll out to other agencies. SBS gets money, the other agencies get AWEI points. Right. So they're all reinforcing one another. OK. And once you're a member, you may as well do the AWEI and vice versa. So I want to make a little note about structure here. So we talk about ACON. It's really important that we always bring it back to ACON is an AIDS charity. Right. That is their purpose. So ACON is the AIDS Council of New South Wales. Pride and Diversity is a business unit within ACON and they operate the Pride and Diversity badge money scheme. They have one for work, one for sport and one for health. And then they have, they also operate the Australian Workplace Equality Index benchmark tool and they have one for work, one for sport and one for health. It can, it can get very confusing. Often it is easier just to say ACON, but it, it does help to know that structure underneath, how it all hangs together. So just to note that ACON are not the only game in town. So we have other benchmarks, other indexes and other, you know, rainbow consultancy schemes. I haven't done a lot of research into the others, but I'm just noting that they're out there. Um, just because an organisation is not technically doing the ACON scheme, it doesn't mean that they're not under the influence of a scheme. So what's the problem? Well, 
for me, one of the things that um, one of the first points where I started to twig as to this being a bit of an issue was when I was looking at the points distribution for all of the different sections in the AWEI. Now, the highest scoring section is for establishing a pride network in your organisation. All of the pride and diversity staff actually were recruited out of organisations where they set up a pride network. So this piece is very, very important to ACON. Now, this isn't just, um, so at my work, right, we have a club for women in tech. We have one for parents. We have one for runners. We have one for photography. They're all grassroots. You know, if all the photographers left, the club would die. Okay. Acon doesn't want that to happen. You have to have a HR manager in the Pride Network. You have to have an executive sponsor and their performance metrics should be tied to the performance of the Pride Network. They have to have a plan of action. They are the ones who are responsible for the WEI goals being achieved. They have to have a succession document for if in case somebody leaves to make sure that the Pride Network continues on. And they receive points for being able to speak to the whole staff, getting the CEO to come to um, like to speak at conferences for celebrating uh, Trans Day of Visibility and all of the other special days. So they're the boots on the ground. They're the people that have the skin in the game. Their performance plans and certainly their AWEI performance points depend on getting you to put your pronouns in your bio, not getting media coverage for the organisation, celebrating the days of significance, running the drag queen bingo, getting the all gender toilet signs up, getting the CEO to speak at a pride and practice conference. They actually have consequences and they establish ACON as an authority in-house. So when there is a problem involving sexuality, sex, gender, gender diversity, diversity, inclusion and well-being, who are you going to call? They're going to call ACON. Just moving on to the media, one of my big questions as a lifelong ABC and SBS only viewer was why haven't I heard of all of this? Well, um, Channel 10 is a Pride and Diversity member. ABC is a Pride and Diversity member and a Gold AWEI performer. Uh, gold is the second highest level that you can get to. So this means that they're actually very closely complying with ACON's agenda. SBS is a 10K member, so they pay extra every year. They're also a media partner, so they do, um, they do media for ACON events. And they're a gold AWEI performer. And um, I just note that these are also the networks where I, I constantly see Jordan Rasko and Shane, Shane Janik. Um, and these men are constantly being like platform to talk about diversity and um, and I actually first saw Shane Janik speaking at the ABC about women's issues. Um, and if you haven't seen ABC Queer, this is an Instagram channel that the ABC created in order to win a media award uh, handed out by ACON. Um, yeah, it, it basically just is, um, it, it promotes the queer agenda. ACON is literally Australia's stone wall. They are quite transparent that they based their, um, their scheme on the Stonewall Diversity Champions Workplace Equality Index Scheme. Now, in October last year, uh, Northern Irish journalist uh, Stephen Nolan issued, uh, published uh, quite a lengthy podcast where he publishes the findings of his investigations into the relationship between Stonewall and the BBC. And one of his comments was the BBC was paying a lobby group 
to lobby it. And there's very strong parallels with what is happening here. Now, at Stonewall, these are famously the people that, that brought you no debate. A, a number of high profile organizations have left the Stonewall scheme as a result of the Nolan podcast. Just having a, uh, just looking at ACON's mission itself, again, they are the AIDS Council of New South Wales. Their mission, and this is still reported in their annual reports, their mission is ending HIV transmission amongst gay men and other homosexually active men. Their, their constituency, their stakeholders, the people that they, they think of are first and foremost men who have sex with men and then uh, sex workers, so trafficked uh, women and men and IV drug users. They receive almost $13 million a year from New South Wales Health for the purpose of ending HIV, right? Not for any of this other social programming. And they receive another three and a half million for other grants uh, for special projects. Um, it's worth noting um, they are a little bit coy about publishing the actual number of people in New South Wales with HIV. Australia-wide, the number is currently sitting at 29,000. Um, they have very deep links with pharma because HIV pr prevention is all about testing and also um, promoting a drug called PrEP which is like a prophylactic measure. You can take this pill before you are exposed and it can reduce your likelihood of catching HIV. In a wider context, they're not the only AIDS organisation in Australia. So ACON are a member of the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations, along with um, others such as Meridian, which is in the ACT, and Thorn Harbour Health, in Victoria. Um, notably, these AIDS organisations also include Injecting Drug Users League and the Scarlet Alliance. Now, I happen to know that the Scarlet Alliance um, representative on the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations is actually a trans id male. So women don't come into it when these people think about their stakeholders. They, they, we're really not on their radar. So a question I get asked really often is, are they in ACON, right? So is so-and-so in the ACON scheme? And as I had sort of discussed earlier, um, there are a few ways that an organisation can be in the ACON scheme and I'll just note the data that they publish is very patchy and, and it's constantly changing, so it can be hard to tell. For instance, last year um, they removed every single federal organisation that was listed off their website. They just removed 30 organisation names. They're still members, I know, because I have the invoices, right? <laughs> um, so there are clues, though. So if you're looking from the outside, uh, check on their website. So Pride and Diversity have a website that lists um, all of the non-federal government members. Um, and the Australian Workplace Equality Index website will list the award winners, basically. So if someone hasn't done very well in the scheme, then they won't be listed. But if they've sort of made a, a passable attempt, then their, their name will be on that, on that list. Another way to tell is that um, they have the Pride and Diversity ACON or AWEI logo on their website or on their emails. So they often do want to tell you about it, essentially. So if you have correspondence with them, they might even have it in their email signature. A telltale sign for me is often going to the careers page because the AWEI uh, says that you should have a special point of contact 
for trans and gender diverse people on your recruitment page. So if I, if I go to their careers page and I see a note of trans and gender diverse, that's a pretty strong indicator for me. Um, and also if they participate in any corporate branded uh, rainbow events, that's another indicator because uh, that does get them points. If you're inside the organisation, uh, there are other clues such as, you know, do you have a pride network? Are you constantly observing these days of significance? Uh, do you get emails from your CEO or other high ups about we're at Purple Day? Um, and have you been invited to any diversity training sessions or even optional webinars? So something to note is this, tra this training um, that they do roll out, it's often optional, which is good on one hand because you don't have to sit through being indoctrinated but on the other hand it means that only the true believers kind of are getting the message so you know they're they're kind of less likely to be exposed really quickly which brings me to um, another point I do get asked what do I do if I'm if I have to go to gender training or put my pronouns or say my pronouns or put them in my email um, now, probably the first thing I would say is if it's optional, don't go. You don't have to go unless your job actually requires that you do the training. Um, you know, just, uh, just miss it. If you have to go, use it as a chance to observe how others in the workplace are reacting to the content because this could actually give you some really good clues as to uh, who you can have a civil conversation with after the training is over. So you could use it as an opener to sort of feel some people out. From what I know of the presenters, challenging them is probably not going to be successful. Uh, these are very dogmatic and ideologically driven people and they, they don't like being challenged or questioned and you may end up just, um, you know, feeling unhappy at the end of it. Uh, sometimes you do get a chance to ask an anonymous question, especially in these days of like Zoom meetings and, um, and Teams meetings. Sometimes they'll actually let you put questions in anonymously. Uh, and this can be a good way to raise an issue or raise something that's a little bit complicated that maybe they might have trouble explaining. So it can make them, them look a bit foolish. And uh, lastly, uh, once you have gone to gender training, you know, share your experiences with others, uh, let people know what strategies you used and, um, you know, what worked, what didn't. If you do have a really egregious experience, do get in contact with me. I'm happy to publish uh, anonymous accounts as appropriate. And uh, I'll just say for more information, I will put these slides up on my blog and that will have all of the links and everything in there. So, cool. Thanks for listening, everyone.